And joining us now on the debate, in the nation's capital, Stéphane Dion, just re-elected as the Liberal Member of Parliament for saint laurent cartierville and the party's former leader, of course, and Minister of the Environment. And happy to welcome back as well Jeffrey Simpson, National Affairs Columnist with the Globe and Mail, also co-author of Hot Air, Meeting Canada's Climate Change Challenge. And with us here in studio, Keith Stewart, Energy and Climate Policy Analyst for Greenpeace Canada, and John Bennett, Executive Director at Sierra Club Canada. Uh, good to have you gentlemen back here in the studio. And Monsieur Dion, congratulations to you on your re-election. Jeffrey, good to see you again as well. Let me just start by bringing up uh, Michael Smith, if you would, our director. Bring up this graphic because we, um, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we're going to spend a bit of time on what happened when people voted in 2008 compared to 2011. Now, let's just go across the five parties. We start with the blue bar, which is the Conservatives, who were up over 620,000 votes nationally. If you look below the line, that's more than 150,000 votes they lost in the province of Quebec. The Liberal vote compared to last time was off more than 850,000. The NDP vote, as we all know, went off the charts this time. Two million more this time than last. The Bloc Québécois almost down half a million votes. And this is the one we really want to focus in on tonight. The Green Party, despite electing their first MP, actually lost more than 360,000 votes between the last election and this one. So, Jeffrey, let me go to you first on that. What do you think accounts for the fact that the Green Party, despite electing someone, actually lost a good chunk of their support this time around? I think two things, maybe three. One is that Miss May pretty much spent all of her time in her own riding as opposed to <clears throat> being more present, if I can say, across the country, and she wasn't part of the TV debate. But I don't think that's the principal reason. I think the principal reason is that since 2008, the environment as a whole and climate change in particular is simply not as salient. Why is that? I think the recession knocked many issues off the agenda. I think the failure of international negotiations to make more progress uh, made it easier for people in this country who don't want to do very much to carry on in that tradition. I think the failure of the United States to put in place a climate change policy that would be a cap and trade that we would have to adjust ourselves to. So external pressures, be it the recession, be it the United States situation, the international negotiations, took the issue very much off the agenda. And I also think, although it pains me a lot to say this, that some of the climate change skeptics and deniers, both in this country and abroad, uh, have done a pretty good job at peddling their wares over the last few years and may have persuaded some Canadians that maybe this isn't the right time to take action. So it wasn't just the campaign that Elizabeth May ran or didn't run. I think the issue that drove the Green Party and perhaps drove the Liberal Party to some extent three years ago had simply faded as a public issue. Let's break down the vote a little bit more if we can and look uh, in particular at what happened province by province across the country. Next chart, Michael, if you please. Once again, comparing 08 and 11, and if you look on the top of that chart, you can see the Greens, what happened to their vote in the Prairies, in Alberta, in B.C., Atlantic, and Quebec. It's all off a bit, but their numbers in Ontario are down significantly. They lost half their votes in the province of Ontario alone. And to the two guys who work here in Ontario, okay, let's start, John, with you first. Um, do, on do Ontarians care less about green issues today than they did two and a half years ago? I don't think so. I think that this, the, the issues in this election were... were not properly presented, and that's in terms of the environment. I think that Elizabeth being excluded from the, from the debate, and the fact that even though 6,000 wow. questions were submitted for the debate, not one of them was, was on the environment. I don't believe there wasn't one of them in the 6,000, but the media certainly decided that we weren't going to talk about the environment in this election. The media didn't ask the other parties. Um, they just let whatever the spin was telling them to go, to go with. They didn't actually be, do the responsible kind of journalism we need, which is to ask questions about important issues and about important decisions that are going to have to be made in, the, in any government's tenure. Well, well, Keith, I'm not here to defend the media, but presumably the media cover what happens. And certainly it's accurate to say, I think, that the parties themselves focused a heck of a lot less on the environment, and therefore so did the media. Fair comment? Well, I think you had four parties that actually had environment as a part of their platform. It wasn't always the first thing they presented, but like, I couldn't help noticing the NDP's first policy announcement was they were going to eliminate uh, subsidies to the oil industry, and they were going to turn those into subsidies for green energy and conservation. Um, I looked through all the coverage. There was lots of coverage of the fact that how Jack looked that day when he did his policy announcement. There was coverage of the fact that that number, his poll numbers were down, without mentioning what he had actually said. 
what he was going to do, um, which was a little frustrating. But I think part of what we also saw here in Ontario and perhaps across the country for the Green Party was the orange wave took a lot of those green votes. People saw, you know, the, the NDP platform was pretty good on the environment. And I think people said, OK, I could actually get someone environmentally minded elected. And a lot, I think a lot of the Greens moved their votes to the NDP to try and get the NDP over the top in their, their riding. So the orange wave, I think, actually hurt the Green Party in that sense. But I think in terms of the overall support for the issue, that's still there. OK. Stefanzio, I wanted to give you a chance to listen to what everybody else had to say so you'd get, if you like, uh, the last word on this one. How do you see it? Well, I see that the party that won the election barely mentioned the environment in their platform and made a virtue of not put a price on carbon at all. So this is the result we, we had. Uh, I see that most parties focused on the immediate problem of, uh, problems of the economy and, and families. And I understand why it's what people had in mind in, in, in at the time where the world, the slowdown of the economy is not over. But I see that is not necessarily what happened elsewhere. In Germany, the lender uh, had a regional uh, election recently, and the Greens made uh, a lot of, of uh, success there, a lot of, of gains. So um, for the future, I hope uh, Canadians will continue to, to, uh, to follow the issue of the environment. It's not because we did not focus on this problem that the problem disappeared. At the moment where we speak, you have tragedies in Manitoba and Quebec uh, because of uh, the big rains that happened. And it is very an irony that uh, the, the newspaper Nature, a month before the election, came with two studies showing that indeed uh, big rains will come more and more because of climate change. So it's not because we want to avoid to tackle the problem that the problem will disappear. Jeffrey, you remember well back in the 2008 election, uh, Monsieur Dion uh, ran on uh, the so-called green shift. He put the environment front and center in the liberal platform. Uh, he even had a kind of a non-aggression pact with the Green Party. He didn't run a candidate against Elizabeth May, and the Green Party didn't run a candidate against him. To your knowledge, was there any kind of focus or accent on any interesting ideas like that in this campaign? No. I mean, he used to blame me for being the intellectual godfather of the carbon tax since I put it in that book that you recommended. Um, no, there was no talk of carbon tax. What there was in two of the platforms, the Liberal platform and the NDP, was a cap-and-trade system. Uh, one of your guests, I'm not sure, John perhaps, said that the NDP had a very strong uh, green platform. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. They had 16 promises and programs for green energy which were going to cost $6 billion, and they were going to pay for them through a cap-and-trade system that was supposed to raise $7 billion. Now, I think all four of us in this discussion tonight know that a cap-and-trade system allows you to indicate what the level of emissions might be, but you don't know what the per carbon ton price is going to be. So to say that they were going to raise $7 billion from a carbon tax was a complete invention. And therefore, there was an immense hole right in the middle of the NDP platform. As for the Liberals, and Stefan can talk about it more articulately than I can, there weren't very many details about how a cap-and-trade system would work. So last time the Liberals talked about a carbon tax, it obviously wasn't politically saleable. This time they talked about a cap-and-trade system, but they didn't mention it very much. And the NDP had it in their platform, but as I just explained, it wasn't credible at all in terms of how they were proposing to finance it. Monsieur Dion, when you presumably tried to get the environment higher up on that list of priorities that liberals would run on, I, I'm guessing people in the party came back to you and said, look, we tried that last time and, and you know, we got clobbered. We're not going to do it again. Is that right? Well, what, what happened last time, as you may remember, is that indeed we focused a lot on the link between the economy and the environment and social policies, by the way. And we had a very poor result. And there was the sense that the environment is a risk for a political party. I feel guilty for that because I think the first time women asked for the right to vote, maybe men said no, but they started to try again and again. And one day it happened. So it's not because it did not work the first time that we should we should give up. I think the problems are still there, and we need to focus on, on that more than ever because the problems will become bigger and bigger and bigger. John, that's a good point. You know, the, the, the conventional wisdom in this campaign was Stéphane Dion led the Liberals 
to a loss last time because he focused too much on the environment. Therefore, let's not run on the environment. That was everywhere in this campaign. I heard that over and over again. Can you blame people for feeling that way? No, but I, I think that the, the 2008 campaign was more about the character assassination that the Conservatives launched against Mr. Dion. I think and, that happened this time too, didn't and it? The, and at the same time, you know, and this, so the, the media focused much more on, on the ball game, on whether or not what they were saying about each other, what, what, what charges they were making, but they didn't talk about the issues. So we don't know from this the result, we can't tell from this result whether people are thinking about the environment or not. They weren't given a lot of information to actually make that decision. Well, Keith, let me get you to speculate on that. Everybody who went to vote last May 2nd went into the ballot box and they had to factor a whole range of things in their head before they marked their X. Where in that whole range of things do you suspect the environment was? I think, like, well, the polling shows that people care about the environment. I think part of it is they're not clear on what can be, what needs to be done about it. And I think this is where actually some of the, because politics is about issues but also interests. And some of the interests, as Mr. Simpson said, you know, have been muddying the waters greatly to try and get people confused. Oh, can we do anything? What will work? I don't know enough, so I'm just not going to, I'm not going to make that my issue. Um, but I would, however, like to just address something uh, Jeffrey Simpson said, which was, I think if you look at the NDP platform closely, they actually had a mix of a carbon tax and a cap and trade system because they were saying they were going to auction a portion of the emissions allowances for their cap and trade system with a floor price, which essentially is a carbon tax. So the first 22.5% of the, the emissions were going to be basically taxed at a rate of $45 a ton, which is where they got that number, which was a way to do a, a carbon tax without calling it that because, of course, the carbon tax had been demonized so, excessive, so successfully in 2008. Well, we got nobody on the NDP on this program to defend this, but Jeffrey, if you want to come back one more time uh, against Keith here. No, just look, the NDP has a clear record of opposing carbon taxes. They ran a campaign in British Columbia called Axe the Tax against Gordon Campbell's uh, carbon tax, which all of us in the, well, you in the environmental movement and I who want action on climate change widely hailed, and they attacked it. So they have a clear record of not liking carbon taxes, period. Okay. Mr. Dion, let me ask you about this. What does it say about how much Canadians truly care about the environment, not just how much they say they care, but how much they truly care about the environment, when it seems that it is so easily trumped by other issues, jobs, economy, health care, deficits, whatever. What do you think? Well, I think it's, um, it's happening elsewhere as well, uh, that the environment is perceived as a, as a burden that you impose to the little guy and then people said, I'm for the environment if you are taxing or asking the big guys, the big polluters to change. But me, myself, when we have difficulties to pay our, our, our bills at the end of the month, don't ask me any sacrifice. And politicians are aware of that and they are very, very careful. We love to speak about the environment when it's about the beautiful nature and national parks and so on. But when it's, 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 it's the time to ask people to change their behavior, uh, then we are very careful because we know that the, uh, the opponents will destroy us very easily with that. Uh, it's why, for example, politicians prefer to speak about cap and trade than instead of carbon tax, even though most economists would say that the carbon tax is much more effective. It's because cap and trade, nobody knows exactly what that means. Until Mr. Harper started to say that it was a tax uh, and he made a virtue to not put the price on carbon at all. He has been elected on that. And this is a shame when you think about that. Canada should be a leader to help humanity to face this danger, to have a divorce, divorce with, the, with the planet. And instead of that, we have elected a man who, who said, no, no, we'll do nothing. We'll wait for the United States. That, that means for the US Congress that is blocking uh, President Obama. And, and it's where we are. We are in a big mess. Well, Jeffrey, I wonder if that helps make the point. The Canadians say that they care about the environment, but in fact, they've picked as their government the one party that actually had very little to say about the environment in the past election. What do you think? Well, two, two points. First of all, <clears throat> if you look at polling data um, and you look at who disagrees with climate change, i.e. that it actually is a real thing, um, they are disproportionately conservatives. Uh, and they are higher in Alberta than they are in other provinces, and that's the conservative heartland. So Mr. Harper has within his broad coalition more people who are either in denial or skeptical or aren't sure about the economics than the other parties do, which is one reason why he puts a break on action. Secondly, the conservative position is that we should reduce and we will reduce our emissions by 17% from 2005 levels by 2020. 
Steve, I can tell you with all the sincerity that I can command that I have asked experts in the petroleum industry, in the government of Canada, in provincial governments, in foreign embassies, and in the universities, and I have not found a single breathing person who believes that we will meet that commitment. Hmm. And it's very sad because, as you know, Canada's had a very long record of making commitments and not achieving them. But what's masterful in this instance is that the government keeps putting this in the window. And yet, as I said, no person that I have talked to who is knowledgeable about this subject, including in the highest levels of the civil service of Canada, does anybody believe that that's credible? I get invited from time to time by foreign ambassadors, and they often say to me, you know, our embassies have studied the Canadian position, and we can't figure out how you're going to get this done. Maybe you can, because you're supposed to be closer to the scene. I throw my hands up and say, gentlemen, ladies, you got it right. So that's where we are. Now, you might say, why is it that Canadians aren't more upset about the fact that we get dragged at international conferences into winning the Fossil of the Year Award? Well, why didn't we get more upset that we, for the first time, lost election to the Security Council? I mean, we apparently have become rather immune in Canada from the fact that our reputation internationally is not what we always wanted it to be. Well, let me try this one here. And here I'm going to come at you uh, environmentalists at this table here in Toronto on this. Is it possible that despite the fact that we, we think we're pretty green as a, as a Canadian people, that you environmentalists, John, to you first, have not really broken through to the average Canadian in a way in which they can understand the issues and how it affects them on a daily basis in the way that perhaps Stephen Harper clearly did with his singular message during the past 37 days. Well, let's keep in mind that 60% of the people actually voted for parties that wanted to take action on climate change. So the majority of Canadians actually voted to, to, to act on climate change. In the 2008 election, it was 68%. So the majority of Canadians are still understanding that things have to happen. Uh, but I, I think tr it's true that we've ha we have to figure out how to communicate this and how to communicate the urgency. And we've been working on it. It's the most complicated, difficult, challenging thing um, to communicate as well as to do. I think one of the things that we should really c keep in mind is that over the last five years with, the, with, the, with the Stephen Harper in power is that because they were doing nothing, we actually had trouble getting stories when we, we tried to get the media interested in the fact that the government was not doing things. I was getting reporters saying to me, well, it's not news that they're not doing anything. I wrote about that six months ago. I wrote about it two years ago. Mm -hmm. And by the time this election came by, it wasn't an issue because there was no way to get a story because there was nothing new. Um, and that's a change in the Canadian media over the last five years that wasn't there before. All right, Keith, let me try this with you then. There are more hybrids on the road. There are more environmentally friendly cleaning products in our homes. There are more corporations with sustainability programs in place. There are more CFL light bulbs in our homes. Is it possible that you guys are simply a victim of your own success? You're doing better than you think. Um, I mean, first of all, we have, I think we should bear in mind the, the scale of the task. We're talking about rebuilding the foundation of our industrial society. So the fact that we haven't managed to do it in the last couple of years is, should surprise no one. <laughs> Particularly when you think of some of the most powerful institutions in our society make a lot of money by being allowed to pollute for free. So trying to get them to pay for that, they will fight hard against that. And that's one of the things that we are running into. We also run into the problem of, frankly, you know, the government does quite simply lie about what it's doing. You can go to the Environment Canada website. They actually have a report up that says current, what the current government is doing, including all the provincial stuff and the federal government, would achieve 25% of the reductions required to achieve this target that the environment minister keeps saying that they're, they're, they're going to meet. And, you know, they're not. They, the government reports show they're, they're only 25% of the way there, but they just keep asserting that they're going to meet it. And it gets reported as, well, the government says that they're going to do it, and other people say that they won't, um, as if, you know, these were contestable. It's like, so I think part of it is this, and again, on sort of the climate change front, you know, there's a lot of the campaign of disinformation is about sowing enough doubt that people turn away from it. Because, you know, if it's not clear what needs to be done or people don't seem to agree, then, well, maybe I'm not going to focus on that. And I think that's one of our big problems is we need to have an honest conversation about it. And that's really hard in the current politics of this country to have a, have a conversation about issues in depth well, rather want, than about leaders. I want to pick up on, on one word you use there, and that word is lie. And uh, let me get uh, first uh, Jeffrey Simpson and then Stefan Zion to talk about this. The word lie gets thrown around a lot. Uh, in, in politics all over the world these days. 
and I want to know whether you gentlemen believe that in fact what's happening is that the government is lying, purposefully lying about its record or just failing to achieve what it's set out to achieve. Jeffrey, you first, then Stefan I, I, I don't like to get into discussions of lying. That's, that's a language I don't like. Um, I'm just stating and restating the fact, as I understand it, which is that this target, which the government has insisted is a credible target, is not one that anybody I know finds credible with the policies that we have at the moment. Now, the policies could change, of course. I wouldn't have thought the policies will change, Steve, given the results of the election campaign. I think the government would probably say, look, we didn't much talk about this. We have a certain number of policies in place. The electorate doesn't seem too upset about it. If they were very upset about it, they would have punished us more. The fact that 60 percent of the people, by the way, didn't vote conservative doesn't mean they want big action on climate change. If they did, the other parties would have mentioned it a great deal, and they didn't. Mm -hmm. I hate to say this, it really pains me to say it as somebody who would like to see more vigorous action on climate change, but over the last three years, in all the polling data that I saw, there was a sharp decline in the public's interest in and support for measures on climate change. And it's not because the media stopped reporting it, and it's not because you, Steve, and the other journalists didn't ask them questions during the election campaign. There were much bigger factors than that at work internationally and in terms of the recession. With this, I'll end my point. I thought, wrongly, back in 2006 and 2007, that for the first time we had been able to get away from the old paradigm, which was if you did something about the environment, you were going to hurt the economy. I thought we'd got by that. I was wrong. In the minds of many Canadians, especially having gone through that difficult and severe recession, that trade-off, do something about the environment, hurt the economy, is still present and living in the minds of many Canadians. And that's a reality. It's a painful one for me to state, but I believe it to be correct. Stefan Dion, can I get you to comment on that last point, which I think is, is clearly an important one. Do Canadians still believe, generally speaking, were you hearing this at the door as you campaigned in your riding, that people still think going green will cost us jobs, not create us jobs? Yes, I think so. I, I think that if you ask them the question, do you think it's good for the economy and the environment to be together, people will say yes. But when it's more concrete, when we speak about uh, d different strategies for our economy, they are very, very concerned that it will cost jobs for, for them. And it's easy for uh, the conservatives with uh, all their machine to come with their spin and to create this fear uh, among the people. But if we look, if we look what Canada uh, will do in the coming years and decades, if we don't change, we'll become more and more a petrol economy. We'll kill more and more our manufacturing sector. Our currency will go up and up following the price of oil that will go up. It's uh, certain that it will be the case. I say that this strategy is wrong for the country, including Alberta and Saskatchewan. If we were asking the oil patch to clean their mess, you would have a much more diversified economy. You would use much more the skills and talents of young Albertans and people of Saskatchewan and everywhere in the country. It would be much better for the economy. It's what I argued in 2008 with the results you know in Alberta and Saskatchewan for the Liberal Party. <laughs> All right, let me, uh, because you've given me a nice segue to this, I want to quote something that uh, George Monbiot uh, wrote in uh, The Guardian. Uh, actually, it was on Election Day that it was a published, uh, Election Day here in Canada. It's a little bit on the long side, gentlemen, so get comfortable. Last week, something astonishing happened. The chief economist of the International Energy Agency revealed that peak oil has already happened. This raises an awkward question for us Greens. Why hasn't the global economy collapsed as we predicted? Yes, it wobbled, though largely for other reasons. Now global growth is back with a vengeance. The reason is that natural gas liquids and tar sands are already filling the gap. Not only does the economy appear to be more resistant to resource shocks than we assumed, but the result of those shocks is an increase, not a decline, in environmental destruction. The problem we face is not that we have too little fossil fuel, but too much. As oil declines, economies will switch to tar sands, shale gas, and coal. We have enough non-renewable resources of all kinds to complete our wreckage of renewable resources. Forests, soil, fish, fresh water, benign weather. Collapse will come one day, but not before we have pulled everything down with us. All of us in the environment movement, in other words, are lost. None of us yet has a convincing account of how uh, humanity 
can get out of this mess. Now, George Monbiot, John, I don't have to tell you, is one of the leading voices in the world on the environmental issues. Lots of people read him. If he doesn't know how we're going to get out of this mess, how are the rest of us supposed to know what to do? Well, I think he's having a rough spring. He, he is. is definitely he depressed. Is. So that's not the only thing he said in the last few months. It's depressing. Um, it's a challenge. Um, we have to re refocus what we do. We used to, in this country, have, have governments that were incrementally moving in the right direction on environmental issues in general and climate change in particular. Um, for the last five years, we've not had a government that, was, that wanted to move in any direction in terms of progress. Um, we, have try, try, we are trying to find the right ways to argue this and, and present it to the public. Um, and it's a, it's a challenge we're going to do. I'm thinking that over the next five years, I'm going to spend an awful lot of time in court um, as we have, as we try to f enforce the governments, both provincially and federally, to actually enforce the environmental laws that we do have before they complete the destruction of them. Um, but I think we're going to see over the next five years an awful lot of court action. Stefan Zion, if this is what George Monbiot feels, what are the rest of us supposed to think? Yes, I fully agree with him. In fact, it's not because the price of oil is going up that we will stop to pollute. We may replace oil by something even, even more polluting, like uh, uh, li liquid coal, for example. It's more and more what uh, it, it's, we are at risk to see happening, a new era for coal instead of uh, going green. So, yes, we are at the crossroad. But at the same time, uh, many studies show that we may choose a different path. This may be better for the economy. Some countries are doing it big time more than Canada. I just said that in Germany, uh, the, green, the Green Party and the, 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 the Green Cause is much more stronger than in Canada. The same for Scandinavia. We'll see what will happen in Japan. So we should not give up. And I hope Canada will be part of the solution, but not with this government, I'm afraid. Keith Stewart, do you agree with Monbiot when he says, quote, none of us yet has a convincing account of how humanity can get out of this mess? Well, yesterday the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the premier scientific body on climate change, published a huge report on renewable energy, which actually had a, looked at a variety of scenarios, said, you know, that there's no technological barriers or even really cost barriers to massive implementation of renewables. One of those scenarios that they, they looked at 164 scenarios focused on four. One of those was actually developed by Greenpeace in cooperation with the renewable energy industry. And you know, we sort of mapped out a strategy that included like, you know, the, the technical stuff, the thermodynamics of the whole thing, but also the policies. And that's what we're pushing at the global level to try and get that energy revolution which would actually stop climate change. Because it's going to be a huge task, and we have to start right now. And this is also why, for instance, Greenpeace has a major campaign against the tar sands because they are the thin edge of the wedge on these unconventional fuels that Monbiot is talking about. Notice, if we start down that path... You don't call them path, the oil sands, I notice. You call them the tar sands. We call them... I'm, I can go either way. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, They're the tar sands. That's what they were when they started. They just changed it to, for Marketing cosmetic purposes? reasons later yeah. on. Okay. So the... You know, it's not that the tar sands all by themselves will destroy the climate, but the fact if we go down that road where we're going for those dirtier and dirtier fuels, then we're cooking the planet. We actually have solutions which can take us in another direction. The problem is you have existing industries with existing jobs versus industries that are in the process of being born and jobs that will be there. And if you're in politics, one of those has a lot more influence than the other. Sure. Jeffrey, can I get you on that comment? None of us yet mm -hmm. has a convincing account of how humanity can get out of this mess. He's clearly having a bad spring, That's as right. John put it. It, it. No, 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 no. He's right. He's right. I mean, look, we've had international negotiations going back to Kyoto. And they haven't produced an international agreement that's binding on enough countries to reverse the trend. And we didn't make progress at Copenhagen, and we did a little better in Mexico City. We, the world. So we haven't certainly figured out internationally how to deal with a global problem. No one country can deal with it. In our own country, we have many impediments. We've talked about some. The fact that provinces control natural resources makes it very tough to have a national policy. We've had increased economic growth. We've had higher population growth, uh, et cetera. Let's talk just briefly about Ontario, because this is, I think, the test case for renewables. The government of Ontario, I'm putting this simply, has put in place a series of huge subsidies in order to encourage different kinds of renewables, notably solar and wind. The uh, argument is that this is better for the environment, and it's also a job creator for Ontario in manufacturing where so many jobs have been lost, notably in the automobile sector. That's the trade-off. 
Now the subsidy levels that they're asking Ontario taxpayers to pay are enormous. And let's be honest about it. On a kilowatt hour basis, the subsidies for solar and wind are exceptionally high. Now, is this going to survive the election campaign coming in October? Because the leader of the opposition says he's going to eliminate them. If you are a consumer of electricity in Ontario, you are paying high rates and you're going to pay much higher rates, not just because of the renewables, but because of the debt of the nuclear problem and because of the need to replace the aging infrastructure. So you've got your classic hard-pressed, hard-working, as they always say in politics, Ontario taxpayer who's paying higher, tax, higher energy bills already and their bills are going to go up in order to support green energy. And we shall see in the fall, I'm not prejudging the outcome, what the results of that campaign will be because on those results will rest this gamble, if you like, or this policy that the present Liberal government has put in place. And if it doesn't work politically here, it's hard to imagine that other governments across the country are going to embrace it with great vigor. John, just before you respond to that, and I saw you shaking your head when Jeffrey talked about the subsidies, uh, the leader of the opposition, Tim Hudak, did say today in the Ontario legislature that if he does win the government in the fall, he will scrap the $7 billion Samsung deal, which has captured so much attention around the world for making Ontario one of the greenest jurisdictions anywhere, but which has, critics would say, resulted in some fairly high prices for energy. Anyway, you go ahead. Well, it's, it's interesting that the renewables get penalized for honesty. Um, we don't talk about the, the fact that the way, reason we're paying more, in, more for our electricity is about nuclear power and about the hidden subsidies that we've, that we've always buried for the last 50 years. Um, they're costing Ontario, Ontario ratepayers the money. Um, the subsidy program that's in place for renewables in Ontario is about getting, it's about kickstarting an industry. You can't take the numbers that we have now and, and extrapolate them into the 27 or 30,000 uh, megawatts we're going to need in the, in the future. Uh, they're not going to be paying that. We're not going to be paying that when it happens. This is just to get started. Well, the prices are already coming down. They're already coming down. In fact, nuclear and coal are going up <coughs> and natural gas is going up and renewables are coming down. Um, so yes, it's a difficult argument and we have politicians who are willing to play games with it. And that's exactly what's happening in Ontario, is that the Conservatives under Hudak are playing games and misleading the public, because there's no way that, and you know, I'm not using that word either, um, mm -hmm. but they're misleading the public if they're getting, trying to give them the impression that scrapping the Samsung deal is <coughs> going to affect their price of their electricity. It's going up to pay for things that they've already incurred the debts for. It's not going Steve. up because of the future price. Okay, Jeffrey, come on. Steve, in France, they're doing a full review of the solar subsidies. I was in Australia in November. New South Wales is reduced dramatically its uh, subsidies for solar because they were deemed to be too high. The Ontario government has already reduced its subsidies for solar because they were too high. So there is a reaction against these subsidies, not just in Ontario, because they are exceptionally high. I agree they're there to kick start. I'm simply raising the question, and we'll know in the fall, whether the voters of Ontario are prepared to accept the kick on which is the impact on their own hydro bills. I don't know the answer. Stéphane Dion, what do you think on that issue of whether or not we're paying too much to create an industry here, which presumably will, at some point in the future, you know, serve us much better than coal-fired generating stations, that's for sure. We need a policy. We need to design the policy in a way that it will be a gain for the economy, and this is possible to do. You just mentioned, uh, some of us mentioned that some politicians want to uh, to make gains in that be, in being not uh, in creating fears among among the people. The question is, how many politicians will be courageous? Uh, let's th take the example of British Columbia. I think Premier Campbell has been courageous to come with the first significant carbon tax in North America. But that thirty dollars a ton of CO two is not enough to make a difference. So, how many politicians in British Columbia will say we need to go further ahead with this policy? Uh, or some others may say, no, no, we should stop and uh, avoid it uh, completely. We'll see. The problem is, it's not uh, only once that you need to be courageous. You need to be courageous at every election and continue the path in order to have this change that we need to have. Well, speaking of courage, I've got 30 seconds left, Monsieur Dion, and I want to ask you this. I'm hearing lots of rumors that you and Elizabeth May, who got along so well in 2008, uh, might want to get together again. Any chance that you would walk over to the Green Party? I'm a liberal. I think that our party is the best one one day 
uh, to make this, this link between the economy, the environment, and social policy. It's my fight. I want to cooperate with Madame May and Mr. Layton and, and, and Mr. Harper when it's possible. Uh, but I'm a liberal, and I will always stay a very proud liberal. And I think our party will come back. We'll start. We'll work very hard on that, and I will make sure that the environment will be at the core of our renewal. Understood. Monsieur Dion, Jeffrey Simpson, thank you so much for being there in our studios in Ottawa and here in Toronto. Keith Stewart from Greenpeace Canada, John Bennett from Sierra Club Canada. Merci beaucoup tout le monde.